All right, let me, uh, let me welcome all of you here. I know there are other members that are going to be joining, and perhaps I'm going to wait till the full introduction I wanted to do. As members come in here, let's just have them take seats on either side. Uh, this is an extraordinary meeting, and before we actually get started, I want to thank especially the speaker for uh, his leadership. That's cliche we always use around here. But the idea of actually coming together and trying to find out ways that we can improve relationships um, between local governments, states, tribes, and the federal government, especially how we can structurally organize ourselves to make sure that decisions are going to be made as close to the people as possible. I appreciate the speaker who understands this concept of the administrative state versus choices and options that have to be there. I also want to thank speaker, or, uh, former Speaker Pelosi for her work on this effort to appoint other people. As the members show up, we're just going to have them come in here and work through that. But I realize that Speaker Ryan is on a tight time schedule, and I appreciate him being the one to come here and to kind of kick off this event. And let me yield to you to whatever time you need. And thank you. And Jerry, take a seat. We'll give you a sign. Come on, Jerry. Yeah, up here. And I'm not going to tell you what the sign is, but you know what it's going to be. <laughs> oh, okay, let me first thank you, Chairman Bishop. Um, I also want to start by thanking Leader Pelosi and uh, the members on both sides of the aisle who agreed to serve on this task force. And I see that members are just now beginning to assemble. Uh, I want to thank the witnesses for coming here today uh, and those who volunteered to serve on the advisory board of the task force. That's very, very important. Um, and I want to thank you, Chairman Rob Bishop. Um, this was basically your idea. Uh, we are here today because of your commitment to a bipartisan dialogue on federalism. Um, and this is meant to be a bipartisan dialogue on federalism that's truly from the bottom up. Um, the way I see this is federalism does not necessarily belong to one party or the other. It's a founding principle that we all cherish. It embodies the genius of genuine self-government because government works best when it works from the bottom up when it is accessible and accountable to the people it serves and responsive to their needs. Uh, but in recent years, the principle of federalism has slowly eroded under an overreaching federal government. Uh, in Congress, we may not always see things the same way, but there is no question that we can work better as partners uh, with state, local, and tribal leaders. Uh, we know we've got a lot to learn about state and local leaders and, and what they're doing to solve problems at the local level every day. And of course, Washington does not know best, and one size does not fit all. Uh, more partnership, less arrogance, and a willingness to listen and learn, we believe, will go a long way, and that's what this is really all about. Uh, under Chairman Bishop's leadership, this task force will study ways to restore the proper balance of power between the federal government and the state's tribal and local governments. And it will look at how we can reduce needless regulatory burdens facing communities across the nation. Um, I've always believed uh, that we are at our best when we are debating ideas. Uh, and that's what this is all about, having a good, vibrant debate of ideas. Um, it's about having two ears and one mouth and using them in that proportion. Uh, so I'm looking forward to what this task force produces. I'm very pleased that we have a real um, bipartisan task force here in partnership with our, our local government leaders. And so once again, I just want to thank you, Chairman Bishop, for, for putting this together. I want to thank the members for joining the task force, and I want to thank our partners on the advisory board who represent um, local governments. So thank you very much, and, um, and good luck. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I appreciate that. And I expect you're going to leave me, aren't you? Yes, I am. OK. <laughs> just, just so you know, this doesn't solve sage grouse yet. This is not a trade-off here. Yeah, I, just that I in, had to slip that in, yeah. No, I'm, and for the rest of the committee, I think we're ready to uh, start the bulk of our meeting. Once again, I, I appreciate everyone being here. As the speaker said, this is truly going to be a bipartisan approach. I'm grateful if you look at the members who've been appointed, both by the speaker and the uh, my minority leader. Uh, you have former governors, former speakers of the House of States, former speakers of the House of Territories. You have county supervisors, mayors. There is a wealth of experience that is on that is within this room. I am also appreciative of the advisory council, which actually will increase uh, numbers of people who will be part of that advisory council as we go forward to try and give that kind of expertise that's going to be there. I do want to try and echo and somewhat what uh, Speaker Ryan said and set kind of like the what I see as the ground rules of this meeting, this committee, which is going to be as laid back as I possibly can be with it. But it is one of the problems that it's not called a, a task force on federalism. 
primarily because most people, when they hear the word federalism, their eyes glaze over. It was the essay they didn't write when they were a junior in high school. It is one of those things, though, that to me is not a liberal or a conservative concept. It's neither Republican nor Democrat. It's about two concepts. The founders decided to have this principle of federalism as a way of protecting individual liberty. I also think it's a way of actually advocating for individuals so that people have more choices and more options. So that's how, what we're trying to, to zero in on here. I do not expect this committee to be engaged in great policy debates. What we are really talking about is the ways that we can come up with structures and procedures to guarantee that local government on every level has a greater voice, has a greater opportunity of making decisions, and in some way that we can get out of the mindset that if there's a problem, we are the only ones here in Washington who can solve that problem, and how we can work that structurally into the future so well and gone, when, when we're all gone, that process hopefully can continue on. So that's our goal, that's our purpose for this working group. Now, let me uh, thank members for being here, and I did not know in which order people came, but we'll work this through. I gave you all the option of three minutes for questions or a minute for an opening statement and two minutes for questions. So we're still gonna end on time. Most of you took the option for a minute for an opening statement and two minutes for questions. I'll live with that, and I'm hoping the timer in front of this works because I have no idea. Adam, do you know how to turn the sucker on? Somebody will. Let me let me start down here with Mr. Walker. I think you were here first, and we'll go just go down the row for a minute for opening statements. Thank you, Chairman Bishop. It's a privilege to be with you guys. Uh, certainly want to thank Speaker Ryan and Minority Leader Pelosi for uh, standing up and putting together this task force. Uh, I believe it is important for functional federalism to exist. Uh, but I've often thought, and I think there's proof uh, in most cases, with few exceptions, that the more successful government is how your ability exists in, in to localizing it. Or let me say it this way, to empower local leaders, community leaders, mayors. And I think ultimately that's what drives us. I think there's common ground in that area to be able to move forward. Um, we've seen this relationship break down over the last several decades, and I feel like that this is a, a very positive step forward that we can begin to kind of restore uh, some of the brokenness there. And uh, I am uh, honored and serve with people from both sides of the aisle. I think uh, in looking around, these are people who understand what relationship building is all about. And I think that gives us a great chance for success. Thank you, and I yield back, Chairman. You, you had three minutes, three seconds extra. Do you want to say something for three seconds? Happy to be here. All right. <laughs> I thank you for that. Ms. McGorris Rogers, we didn't tell you about this deal, but do you have a minute we'd like okay. to address this? Well, Good morning, everyone. I, too, am very excited about this project. Uh, I want to be a part of it as a former state rep uh, in Washington State and now as a, a member of Congress. I think that there's, uh, this is just an important time for, for us, and I'm pleased that we're coming together as Republicans and Democrats from uh, all different levels of government to look at this question of how do we best deliver this, the, the services and, and what should that structure look like. I think we can all agree that we want to put people back at the center of this government. And, uh, and this is an opportunity for us to rethink programs, agencies, how, where they would be most effective, most efficient. And uh, Chairman Rob Bishop, I know this has been something that you've been passionate about for a long time. And I am just uh, really excited about us embarking upon this important endeavor as we um, get into the, this year and all of our, our work. Thank you. No, thank you, I appreciate it. Mr. Culverson, you're probably the senior member on this panel here, but you've been talking about this for a long time. You're recognized for a minute. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thomas Jefferson always said that if we would simply apply the Constitution to any problem, uh, no matter how complicated, the Gordian knot will always untie itself. And I've always found that to be true. And the core idea behind the Constitution was that all authority not specifically delegated to the federal government was reserved to the states and the people, respectively. As a member of the Appropriations Committee, I've learned over the years that I've had the privilege of representing West Houston that the primary way the federal government controls state and local governments and has eroded state sovereignty, individual liberty, is with uh, federal grants that have uh, uh, strings attached to them. So one of the ideas that I'll be uh, proposing, Mr. Chairman, is in, uh, legislation that I filed last year that I'll be working uh, uh, to pass again this time that I added as an amendment to the no Child Left Behind Act is to sunset all federal grants unless the state legislatures accept the grants affirmatively, pass on a record vote, and say, yes, we accept the money with all the strings and we surrender control of our public schools to the federal government. And other than what the legislature agrees to, there is
is no federal control over that particular area, in this case, public education. I look forward to working with you, Mr. Chairman, to restore the Tenth Amendment and individual liberty. Thank you. I appreciate that. Mr. Palmer, we're happy to have you here. You're recognized for a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I'm honored to be a part of the, this important initiative. As some of you know, I, before coming to Congress, I spent over two decades running a state-based think tank, and I also helped set up a national network of state-based think tanks, the State Policy Network. So I know how vital state-focused organizations are, and and I know a lot about what you guys are, are dealing with on the ground floor, so to speak, and see the direct impact that the federal government has had on state and localities. I think there are countless ways that we can, can work together. I look forward to working with all of you and, and my Democrat colleagues on, on this task force. Uh, I think there's a lot of opportunity to work on government regulations and unfunded mandates in a number of areas where I think uh, we can all come to agreement. Uh, so I look forward to working with you uh, over the next few months and uh, appreciate the opportunity to serve with you, Chairman Bishop. Thank you. Um, Jennifer, Ms. Gonzalez Colon, another former speaker of the Puerto Rico. I didn't get a chance to talk to you. Do you have a statement you'd like to make now or do you want a longer one later with the questions? That's a good option. Yeah. <laughs> You can okay. do a minute now, two minutes for questions, or three minutes for questions. Uh, then I will, I will yell back, and I will take the, the last option. Okay, and that means you have the record for brevity so far. Thank you. <laughs> Mr. Connolly, you have to break this record for brevity. Thank <laughs> You're recognized for me. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Bishop, and thank you uh, for convening us. Um, I, you know, I spent 14 years uh, helping to run the lar one of the largest counties in the United States. I was elected at large as its chairman. Uh, it's bigger than seven states. Uh, and so we dealt with every aspect of federal and state relationships. And I guess I would say to my colleagues, if we really mean it about devolution, we got to go to the local level. And I can assure you there are issues between state and local just as there are between state and federal. So the idea that just block granting something and letting the states decide is not the answer and will be vigorously resisted by those organizations, including this representative, uh, you know, uh, if, if that's the route we go. I urge this group, which has the real potential for bringing us together in some thoughtful ways, I think, on a bipartisan basis, to avoid big ideological battles and look at some practicalities that would make life easier and more streamlined for our citizens at the state and local level. And, and that's how I approach uh, joining this, Mr. Mr. Chairman, and I look forward to working with all of my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you. That is our goal, indeed. Um, Mr. Grijalva, you have a minute. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and it's good to see that we're starting off with a constructive conversation rather than a, a full-blown partisan fight over whether it's public lands and their role and the role with uh, states and, and counties and localities. Uh, the group testifying today represents voices from the state and local government. I want to stress the importance of including tribal and insular governments in the panel's agenda. I want to thank uh, Chairman Bishop for for working to include National Congress of American Indians on the Advisory Council. Uh, these groups need, groups representing tribal and insular, insular governments need to be, uh, attend these meetings, but also have a seat at the table for their involvement in the matter. Uh, having been a county supervisor for 13 years in Pima County in Arizona, uh, there's a different inverse trickle-down theory that works in terms of uh, the complaints that we had about state intrusion and preemption are, are probably what we're going to hear at other levels. But I look forward to the conversation and yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I appreciate that. And yes, they have been added to the uh, advisory council, so I appreciate it. Mr. Messer. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You know, hope springs eternal. And um, there, are, there are a few opportunities I've had in my five years in Congress that I'm more excited about than this opportunity, this bipartisan commission on restructuring government. Um, I think we all know in our hearts that our current balance of power between the federal government and state and local governments didn't come down from Mount Sinai, that maybe we could re-examine it. I think we also all know that the American people are screaming for a voice. I, I would make the case that from the rise of Bernie Sanders to the election of Donald Trump, the American people are saying they want their voice heard and they want action and I think looking at how we can better empower the American people by bringing government down to the local level where they have the opportunity to interact with them is an exciting opportunity. Hopefully this task force in a bipartisan way will give us the opportunity to 
play a role in that change. And so I thank you again, and I yield back. Thank you. Mr. Brown. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It's a privilege to be on this uh, task force for intergovernmental affairs. Um, I think it's probably more likely we'll achieve successes in creating greater efficiencies between the, the uh, different levels of government and probably less success, although I am optimistic that we might be able to look at a, a rebalance uh, of power. I've worked with the NGA. You guys do great work. We did uh, some BRAC work together. You brought, brought together stakeholders, best practices, demonstrated how we can coordinate between federal and state. I was on the executive board of the Council of State Governments. You guys do a great job, best practices. You know how to make it work. I think we have a lot to learn from you, and thanks for being here. Here. I want to thank the College Park Mayor for being here. I have more municipalities in my district in Maryland than any other member of Congress. Unfortunately, you're not in my district. You're adjacent to my district. You guys are doing great things. Thanks for being here. Mr. Chairman, I yield back the balance of my time. Thank you. I'm glad you found the room on your own without my help here. <laughs> Mr. Zeldin, last but definitely not least, it's only, the it's only the quirk of how people came into the room. I'm sorry, but... Mr. Zeldin, you're recognized for a minute. Uh, I'm honored uh, to not only represent the greatest congressional district uh, in America, the first congressional district of New York, so I don't feel last at all. I understand you left uh, the best for, for last. Um, th this last week was a tough week for uh, all of us up here, uh, for this capital, for our country. Uh, and I, I, being here in a room, this table is filled with you know, have liberal Democrats, conservative Republicans, and, and many in between. Uh, and this represents everything that is right about our system to come together to talk about our differences, to be able to talk to uh, experts from different levels of government to share their insight and to improve our government. Uh, so, you know, here we are one week later. Steve's doing better. Crystal uh, made a guest appearance yesterday at the congressional softball game throughout the first pitch. We saw David last week. Uh, and we pray for everyone who is impacted. And I think that this is a great way to come together to have this dialogue with each other and with our other levels of government to improve our government, to improve our country. I yield back. Now, thank you, and I appreciate those opening statements from those, and there are several members, a couple of members who said they could not be here for this opening meeting. What we hope to do is actually get ideas beginning and then ultimately propose some kind of legislative steps that we can take as a group, but we got a long time to do this, and this is the opening statement. So I appreciate the four of you who have come together to give us our first uh, in this, this beginning session to give us our first element of ideas and concepts that are coming up from the bottom. We thank you for being here. If I could introduce uh, the people who will be speaking to us, we have the Executive Director of the National Governors Association, Mr. Scott Pattison. Appreciate you being here from uh, Florida. What is it? Leon County, Florida. The Commissioner is also part of the uh, board for NACA, or the National Association of Counties. I'm sorry, Brian Deloge. And from the state of Tennessee, the Tennessee Majority Leader, and also part of the, as the former chair of the Council of State Governments, Mr. Mark Norris. Thank you for being here. Senate, right? I'm so sorry. I just, we're, at, okay. We're on the House side here. Just, we're on the true body. All right. <laughs> from College Park, Maryland, the mayor who is there, also a part of the National League of Cities, a board member, Patrick Wollen. I appreciate all four of you for being here. Uh, what we will do is give each of you a chance. We'll start with Mr. Pattison, go down from my left to your right, to my right. Five minutes each for the opening statements, and then we'll start with the questions. And Ms. Gonzalez, since you didn't have the opening statement, we'll give you the first round to make sure you get your three minutes of questions in. All right. Mr. Pattison, thank you for being here. Time's yours. Go for it. Scott Pattison, I'm CEO of the National Governors Association, and I represent the governors from across the nation. More than 100 years old, the NGA is the bipartisan organization of the nation's governors, and I can't tell you how excited and pleased the governors are that Speaker Ryan and the leadership has established this task force on the critical issue of intergovernmental, intergovernmental relations, and that you, Mr. Chairman, along with your colleagues here, are holding this hearing and planning productive and valuable outcomes for this task force. We at NGA appreciate the invitation also to be on the advisory council of this bipartisan task force. The governors in the states, as you know, are unique in that Unlike any other interest group, states are in the Constitution, 
and they have a role in the system that obviously is very critical. And we want to seek to be partners to, bottom line, solve public policy problems. Governors are the CEOs of their states, which are multi-billion dollar operations, and a lot of folks forget they're often bigger operations than most international corporations. The governors, through NGA, applaud the creation of this bipartisan task force and will strive to be an active participant. We really mean that, Mr. Chairman. We want to, to be active and helpful. Governors support a vibrant and strong partnership with the Congress and the administration to maintain and promote a balanced federal system and basically to solve problems. Governors have experience and with state and local officials that they work with, they're working to solve problems each and every day, and they can provide valuable input on important issues of the day that I know you all are thinking about and working all the time, including tax reform, infrastructure, health care, and the list goes on. I know this is the first meeting, so we have some, uh, just some initial recommended actions for the beginning. We recommend the following actions for consideration of the task force. We believe that the task force should recommend and work with the states and local governments to determine more formal ways in which we can provide valuable input on government actions involving state and local government. The task force also, we believe, should lead efforts to promote the doctrine of federalism, the importance of the intergovernmental system, as the foundation for our nation's solving of problems. That means governors believe that a strong cooperative relationship between the states, the locals, and the federal government is absolutely vital to serve the interest of the citizens and, again, to solve public policy problems in our society. Governors emphasize that federal action should be limited to those duties and powers delegated to the federal government under the Constitution. And, of course, we favor very strongly the preservation of state sovereignty when our federal partners legislate or regulate activity in the states and localities. And, of course, we strongly believe and emphasize that federal preemption, preemption should be the exception. We also believe that the task force should, considering, should consider sponsoring opportunities for education and information sharing for federal officials, both political and career staff, both in the administration and the congressional level, about the roles in the operation of state and local government. I have to be honest with you. I've dealt with uh, being a state official and working with states for decades now, and I can tell you that there is not sufficient understanding and information in a lot of parts of the federal government of the role and the problem-solving problem activities of state and local government and educational opportunities could be very, very helpful. We also think that the task force should consider leading efforts to promote this doctrine of federalism and in all kinds of educational ways. I'm going to finish up very shortly with some principles for state and federal re relations. And I think in the opening statements, these were talked about, but they're very important that federal action should be limited to situations in which constitutional authority for action is clear and certain. Federal action should be limited to problems that are truly national in scope and let us at the state and local level deal with the other issues. And finally, federal action should be sensitive to each state's ability to bring a unique blend of resources and approaches to common problems. Thank you very much for this opportunity, Chairman Bishop. Thank you. I appreciate that. We'll now go to Commissioner Deloge from Florida. Happy to have you yep. here. Be recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Chairman Bishop, members of the task force. Um, and we appreciate you convening today's session to mark the creation of this uh, task force. My name is Brian Deloge. I'm a Leon County Commissioner from uh, Tallahassee, Florida. I'm the current president of the National Association of Counties, representing over 3,069 county governments across the country. Um, we're excited about the opportunity this task force presents for collaboration, and we hope to share our ideas for a better partnership, as well as our innovations and best ideas happening across the country. The form of government known as a county was one of the first established forms of government in America and can actually be traced all the way back to England and France in the ninth century. And today, counties have vast responsibilities that impact people's lives every day, and nearly all federal policy decisions impact counties. 
We care about federal changes on health care because we support 1,000 safety net hospitals, 1,900 health departments, local health departments, and 750 behavioral health authorities. Federal policy decisions on infrastructure and tax reform affect counties because we own 46 percent of all public road miles, 40 percent of all bridges, and a third of all the nation's public transportation systems and airports. We depend on tax-exempt municipal bonds and other financing tools to maintain and build this infrastructure. Criminal justice reform remains a top priority as counties own 91 percent of the jails and are working hard to reduce the number of people in our jails who have mental illness and substance abuse disorders. In fact, the U.S. has 5 percent of the world's population but 25 percent of the incarcerated people. And 12 million people approximately a year are cycled through county jails compared to about a million and a half people in the entire state and federal prison system. So counties, from a criminal justice standpoint, are front and center in the, in the uh, criminal justice uh, reform discussion. Counties across the country serve almost 310 million residents, employ 3.6 million people, and invest $554 billion annually in programs and services. And at the same time, counties struggle to fulfill an ever-growing list of state and federal mandates, and the overwhelming majority of states limit our ability to gener generate additional revenue. For a clear sense of how important county services are, I'd like to walk through an example that's impacting counties and families across the country, the opioid crisis. In the unfortunate and all too frequent event that an overdose occurs, someone calls 911 and it's answered by the county dispatch center. County law enforcement, emergency medical services, or firefighters respond to that call. If the individual needs further medical services, they're likely sent to a county hospital or an emergency clinic. If the individual is arrested, they're likely taken to a county jail and become part of the county justice system. After leaving the jail, they'll access county reentry services for things like job training, parole, probation, and substance abuse services. County public health officials also are responsible for disease control as the, ep as the epidemic spreads. And finally, as overdoses are now more lethal than car accidents in the United States today, when someone passes away, they're taken to a county morgue. So given the ride widespread role of counties in just this scenario, it's imperative that the federal and state response to any major issue include a voice of local governments. Local elected officials remain uniquely equipped to understand the impact of legislation or regulations on county economies and budgets. One-size-fits-all approach rarely work for local governments because counties are incredibly diverse. Our counties range from 10 million people in Los Angeles County to 112 people in Loving County, Texas. And we want to be part of the solution, but we have concerns that Congress is focused primarily on federal budget impacts, merely shifting costs from the federal government down to the states and local governments. And we need to focus on improving outcomes for our residents and achieving our shared goals. Regulatory reform holds great promise, but will be insufficient without a strong federal, state, and local partnership. We sincerely hope that this task force will follow in the footsteps of the Advisory Commission on Intergovernmental Relations from decades past. We're interested in bringing our system of federalism back into balance. Chairman Bishop, you have been a great leader with us on public lands management. And we look forward to expanding that work and applying it to this new context. Uh, I'll actually be in Utah in a month or so on an ATV trip on your public land, so I'm looking forward to that. And uh, Mr. Chairman, I'd like to thank you again for your leadership in bringing this task force together, and I'm happy to take questions when appropriate. Thank you. Thank you, and we welcome you into Utah when you get there. Senator, the only reason I gave you crap about being a senator is simply because I think one of the proposals we'll discuss here for more efficient government is to do away with the U.S. Senate. <laughs> it's above and my pay grade. It will probably pass unanimously. <laughs> but notwithstanding, we appreciate you being here. You're recognized for five minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and members, and thank you for the opportunity to appear before you today. I am Mark Norris. I serve as the Senate Majority Leader for the uh, State Senate in the great state of Tennessee. I have the honor of serving the citizens of West Tennessee uh, in general, specifically the 32nd District, which includes Tipton and Shelby counties where Memphis and uh, six other metropolitan areas uh, are, are located. And it's a pleasure for me to be here with the Council of State Governments today. I did serve as the chair of CSG, the Council of State Governments, in 2014. And I'm here in that capacity today. We, we appreciate very much that CSG has been asked to serve on the advisory council, on the speaker's task force, and our mission essentially embodies the same mission of this task force. 
As Congressman Brown can attest, uh, CSG champions excellence in state governments to advance the common good. It's a region-based forum that fosters the exchange of insights and ideas to help state officials shape public policy. It's a nonprofit, nonpartisan organization. It's the nation's only organization that serves all three branches of state government. Our membership includes 56 U.S. states and territories, and six Canadian provinces uh, also partner with CSG. Our offices uh, include the national headquarters in Lexington, Kentucky, to just sort of set the stage here, and an office focused on federal and international affairs here in Washington, D.C. In addition, we have regional offices uh, located in Atlanta, Georgia, Chicago, Illinois, New York City, and Sacramento, California. The CSG Justice Center, on whose uh, advisory board I also sit, is headquartered in New York with offices all around the country. Now, I think most of you realize that CSG provides insights and information to state leaders through various forums and publications and other tools. Services include policy academies, research briefs, webinars, and annual conferences, as well as standard meetings. We provide state leaders with opportunities at the regional and national levels for personal and professional growth. CSG has been a leader in advancing the role of the states in our federal system and working to identify solutions to improve the regulatory process, all of which I say as a means of commending you for including CSG in the Advisory Council because we are here to help. This hearing comes at an important time. Last week, as you know, was National Flag Week, um, during which this year we celebrate the 200th anniversary of the adoption of this proud symbol of our nation's commitment to freedom and federalism in its truest form. Now we celebrate these days since Flag Week through Independence Day as a time to honor what makes us the United States by focusing on what unites us rather than what divides us. We also appreciate, therefore, the administration's expression of support for improving relationships between federal, state, and local governments. In the first months of the new administration, both the President and Vice President have voiced their strong support for doing so, and we appreciate that. Our nation is facing a number of major policy challenges, as have been mentioned, including changes in health care, reforming tax code, improving infrastructure, modernizing current workforce, and a number of others. These federal policies have an enormous impact on our state and local governments, as we've heard, and we must work together to ensure that we get it right. The establishment of this Intergovernmental Affairs Task Force will help. This task force understands the constitutional and foundational role that states play in our federal system. But unfortunately, the general public's understanding of the Constitution is often not as keen, and we commend Congress for supporting various initiatives such as provisions in the recently enacted Every Student Succeeds Act, ESSA, which includes provisions for the teaching of civics and history in our schools. Uh, we believe that state-based innovation continues to be stifled by a growing web of federal policies and regulations. In my remarks this morning, I have included uh, reference to a letter sent on May 22, 2017, by the attorneys general of 16 states, including Tennessee, who wrote the president to express concern about federal regulatory overreach, and we'll make a copy of that available if you would like. Once again, Mr. Chairman and members, we very much appreciate the opportunity to participate in the Advisory Council. It's important work that you're doing, and we're pleased to be a part of it. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Now, thank you for your testimony and for being here. Look, and so people can plan. Before I recognize the mayor, um, it is my goal to make sure that we are done within the hour, half hour. So as soon as the mayor is done, I'll turn to uh, Jennifer for the three minutes that you have. And then, Representative Torres, thank you for being here. You are going to uh, bypass an opening statement anyway, so as soon as Chi's done, I'll turn to you for your three minutes, and then we'll go back to Mr. Zeldin and try and go in reverse order from the way you gave the presentations. So, Mayor, thank you for being with us. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair. Make sure you're turned on there. Thank you. Good morning, Mr. Chair, members of the task force. My name is Patrick Wayan. I, I am proud to serve as a mayor of College Park, Maryland. It's an honor to be here for the inaugural hearing of the Speaker's Task Force on Intergovernmental Affairs. Uh, and to join you as a representative of the National League of Cities, the oldest and largest organization representing America's cities and towns. 
Like the majority of America's local elected officials, I serve part-time as mayor and hold a day job. When I'm not serving alongside my colleagues on the city council, I'm working as the director of government relations at, for Rails to Trails Conservancy, building active transportation networks around the country. Uh, on behalf of the mayors, council members, and other leaders of America's 19,000 cities, towns, and villages, uh, thank you for creating this bipartisan task force on intergovernmental affairs. You are to be commended for coming together in a bipartisan way to examine the current state of intergovernmental relations. When our nation was founded on the principle of federalism, the founders were focused on the relationship between the states and the federal government. The Constitution does not mention the word cities. Instead, cities and their limited powers were created by their respective state governments. Since our nation's founding, however, the role of cities in the lives of everyday Americans has only grown steadily. Today, cities drive the national economy, providing a home to 86% of the nation's population and 91% of the real gross domestic product. Local governments spend approximately $1.5 trillion annually on services that residents expect from City Hall, such as multimodal transportation options, public safety services, clean energy and water, and access to high quality education. Our message to you is simple. When American cities succeed, America succeeds. Despite their growing importance, the authority of local governments has generally waned as their economic influence has grown. The Tenth Amendment reserves authority giving powers to the states, and as a result, there is a great deal of diversity in the ways state and local governments share authority. Some cities are afforded broader authority to best serve the needs of their citizens under a concept known as home rule. Many others, however, fall under Dillon's rule, in which state legislatures can aggressively control various elements of local governments, from their structures and methods of financing to their procedures and abilities to make and implement certain policies. Recently, efforts to preempt local governments at the federal and state level appear to be on the rise. That's simply wrong and counterproductive. As a level of government closest to the people, Local elected leaders are generally pursuing policies that most immediately reflect the values of their communities. You can read more about specific efforts to preempt local control in states across the nation in the National League of Cities report, City Rights in an Era of Preemption, a state-by-state -state analysis, which I am submitting together with this testimony. In the interests of our common constituents, the intergovernmental partnership should not serve as a battleground for divisive issues. Cities value strong, federal and state partnerships. City leaders are using every tool at their disposal to create revenue locally and to stretch local tax dollars. From traditional tools like tax-exempt tax municipal bonds to innovative tax increment financing districts to project-specific taxes approved by public referendum, city leaders are delivering on the expectations of their residents in economically productive ways. Proposed cuts to programs that cities rely on and aggressive preemption efforts at the state level, particularly those spurred by special interest groups, are hurting our ability to serve our local communities, expand our local economies, and ensure jobs for our residents. Ongoing uncertainty over annual federal funding levels makes city leaders and our private partners hesitant and can even jeopardize vital long-term capital improvement projects. Uncertainty over tax reform, including the possible elimination of both the state and local tax deduction, as well as a tax exemption for municipal bonds, makes it difficult for local leaders to do any long-term fiscal planning. Cities rely on partnership with the federal government through programs as diverse as transportation alternatives, the Community Development Block Grant, the Low Income Housing Energy Assistance Program, and others to meet the needs of the local communities we are all elected to serve. It is our hope that the National League of C at the National League of Cities that this bipartisan task force will consider these and other intergovernmental issues with a practical lens that respects local authority and empowers cities to be even greater engines for the economy. Thank you again for this opportunity to comment on the state of intergovernmental relations from the point of view of cities. Thank you, I appreciate it. I appreciate all four of you for giving us that testimony. Anything that you have written or additional stuff if you get it to us, we'll make sure that it goes to the members' offices. I don't know how, quite sure how we're going to do that, but we'll make sure it happens. And that same thing goes to any member that's on the advisory panel. If they have stuff that they want to be disseminated, we will make sure that that takes place. With that, the resident commissioner from Puerto Rico, you're recognized for three minutes. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to thank you and, and thank the speaker and the minority leader for letting me be part of this important task force. And as a former speaker of the House and um, state employee, it, it is a quite opportunity to, to handle these uh, issues. 
and I will uh, begin. Uh, actually, I was part of the CSG uh, executive committee uh, long term ago. So um, I commend your efforts. And in that uh, term, uh, you uh, stated in your um, presentation that uh, the members of the Council of State Government Governments uh, are discussing an overbearing federal government. And you said that uh, some public policy topics uh, were were part of that uh, overbearing uh, federal government. W what are specifics of those federal topics? Well, the generally, thank you, Congressman, and, and thank you for your service to CSG when you were there. Uh, what we are looking for really is solutions. What, what we find oftentimes, preemption has been mentioned, um, regulatory overreach by um, administrative agencies, executive agencies, where they um, have taken license, perhaps, to, to um, to essentially legislate without without actually representing us, as you know, and you're all dealing with those issues. So what we're really trying to do is look for solutions for um, defining what more effective um, consultation is and collaboration, uh, rather than complaining about overreach, finding ways that we can communicate more effectively. In Tennessee, we had uh, an instance where in the case of the, the clean air, clean power regulations, there was pretty effective communication and outreach with our Department of Environment and Conservation. On the other hand, defining waters of the state was, was not as, um, as effective. There was not as effective consultation and that ended up in litigation. So we're looking for ways to, to effectively communicate better and, and avoid those problems. I will make this question and everybody in the panel can either answer or send comments on, on, on the question. Can you provide a list of specific recommendations of what task uh, can this uh, task force uh, enhance in terms of uh, have direct recommendations to delegate power to state governments, local governments, uh, families, and, and uh, the people who are really near to the people and to make that balance of power between Washington and the people that are near uh, to to those decisions. I mean, that's yes, the, the purpose of this committee. Absolutely, and we have, I've included in my remarks, although I didn't talk about the, the principles that, that we are focused on and have been since about 2014, and we'll be happy to do that and then further refine them through this advisory council process to provide more specific suggestions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know my time is up, so I yield back. Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Norma? Uh, thank you. Minutes, thank you, Chairman um, Bishop, uh, for um, having this great idea of creating a committee, um, a working group such as this. And I want to thank uh, Speaker uh, Ryan for convening this meeting today. Um, to our guests, um, I am a, a former city council member, former mayor, former state assembly member, and former state senator in California. I've earned my wings getting here. Uh, literally. Um, I know and I have seen um, the difference that, you know, federal involvement uh, could make in communities like my home city of Pomona um, with a high um, poverty rate and high crime rate. Um, I have, I have um, also experienced, you know, the other side, the red tape um, and the lengthy process of getting approvals for saving a little bit of money for next year to, you know, maybe build a bigger project and those types of things. Um, I am very interested in um, hearing your um, input on how do we, how can we coordinate or better coordinate um, efforts such as the state of California, for example. They just passed a major infrastructure bill. And um, President Trump is proposing a major infrastructure bill also. So how can we work together to ensure that we are maximizing these funds across regions versus our own individual little cities or counties or regions? Um, I happen to represent two counties. And let me tell you, it is so frustrating for me um, to see a project, either an LA County project, come to the county line and then to struggle to get San Bernardino to pick it up from there as their own project, right? Um, 
my constituents drive 40, 50, 60 miles one way to go to work, one way. Um, creating better highways, smart highways, um, has to be a priority for all of us. Um, I have been on, on, you know, talking about a highway of things. Um, how can we partner with um, our, the private sector? Uh, there is a need currently to diversify our electric grid. Uh, for example, uh, there is a need to expand broadband uh, to rural areas. Um, so as we're looking to um, at infrastructure and to spend dollars to rebuild our highway system. Why not bring the electric companies, the gas companies? Uh, why not bring you know Verizon, AT and T um, to the table and and put forward a proposal that would allow us to create a highway of things that could be better secured, be better secure because we're only looking at securing, you know, maybe a line. Uh, I. My time has expired, but I'd love to hear your feedback at some point. Yeah, we'll, we'll have other chances for you to do that. Lee, from here on in, there's two minutes for the rest of us for questions. Lee? Oh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, one of the topics being discussed here as part of tax reform is the elimination of the state and local tax deduction. Uh, I come from New York. Uh, the last speaker comes from California. Uh, we Our Congress is filled with red states, blue states. Uh, can you discuss this from a federalism uh, argument, not so much parochially from where you're from, but maybe more nationally. Um, just a, a quick two cents, uh, just and then yield is, I mean, Abraham Lincoln proposed a state and local tax deduction to help finance the Civil War. Uh, this is money that's already been taxed already, um, but it's a, it's a big issue here. So can you just discuss it from a federalism standpoint? Yeah. Thank you, Representative Zeldin. I think you stated it well that it's a sense of a double taxation and in, in that, in that this is money that's already being taxed. So, so for uh, for the the federal government to come back and tax it after after we collect that to to achieve our needs locally, uh, it does create a, a challenge in, in in terms of federalism. It really limits our ability to to gather the resources that we need to be able to get to get to get our uh, our our key priorities done. So I appreciate your comments. I'd expand a little bit on that. The, the, the parallel to that is the tax exempt status of municipal bonds, which for us at the local level. Is, is critical for us to go forward. I mean, schools are built with these. Any major road projects are built with these. Anything of any infrastructure of any significance, we rely on that. And if, if, uh, if the goal is to try and drive infrastructure, that's going to move things in a negative way. It's going to layer more cost on. It's going to slow or stop projects across the country. So um, in the tax reform, which we applaud, there are some pieces of it that, frankly, if you're not careful, unintended consequences, which will slow things down. I'll just add really quickly, from a governor's perspective, this has just historically always been an understanding since the creation of the income tax, as well as prior to that, that state and local taxes were not also taxed by the federal government. In other words, the deductibility. It's just been a long, our view is historically, it's just always been understood. Thank you. Anthony? Two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Mine is a statement that perhaps may evoke a response. Um, so in each of your organizations, you have executive uh, branch participants, NGA exclusively executive, but the rest of you are executive and legislative, recognizing that it's these two branches working together that develops the programs, the initiatives, the priorities in government. In our relationship between the federal, state, and local um, governments, there are benefits and burdens. The benefit, perhaps the greatest benefit is the resources of the federal government to state and local government. The burden comes in terms of these mandates and regulations. Some are legislative, right, uh, created by Congress. Uh, but over the last 50 years, we've seen the rise of the administrative state. Uh, and that's probably the story of the expansion of the federal government. The rules and the regulations coming out of the executive branch uh, that is that that create these mandates and what could be considered the burdens of the federal government on local uh, government. So I guess my, my my statement is as we go forward and we talk about how we we rebalance the interests, the burdens, this uh, the 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 regulations um, that we that we distinguish between what it is that Congress can do and what it is that the 
executive branch must do, and perhaps, and I have not seen, Mr. Chairman, the composition of the Advisory Council. I know that these four organizations are on our Advisory Council. I hope it includes um, some representation uh, from the federal Article II executive branch, uh, because for us to, as a members of Congress, I think that we're going to do the rebalance or address the burdens. We cannot do that without uh, some cooperation uh, and interaction with with our federal executive counterpart, just like you do with your state and local executive counterparts. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Well, thank you. I appreciate that. Jerry? Two thank you, Rob. I'm going to ask three questions real fast. I need you to answer real fast because I only have two minutes. Uh, so, Mr. Deslodge, Deslodge? Deloge, shouldn't we abolish the Dillon Rule? Wouldn't it be helpful if the Dillon Rule went away? Shouldn't all states allow home rule for localities? Need to hear you. Yes. You concur, Mr. Mayor? Absolutely. Yeah. Okay. Um, I'll explain to you. Mr. Uh, Dylan, Dylan, uh, Dylan Rule says, mother may I. Every locality has to go to the state for permission for the silliest of things and some big things. Uh, home Rule State says, unless we explicitly prohibit it, thou may do it. And Maryland, for example, is a Home Rule State. Virginia, unfortunately, is a Dylan Rule State. Uh, and it's a huge problem for localities. Mr. Mayor, um, what's wrong with the idea of block granting everything and letting the state figure out funding formulas for services to localities? Could that have well, any negative impact on well, urban areas? Well, certainly, and I think, as you mentioned in your opening remarks, uh, Representative Connolly, the, 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 uh, for, first of all, it is the, the local governments. Uh, we are the branch, that, or the, the body that's closest to, to the people, and the, the people that I have to face every week in the, in the grocery store, uh, they want me to do certain things. And, and if everything's just going to the state governments, then, then, it, then it ignores the... Well, and also, some states have been known to be a little prejudicial about some parts of the state and not some others, like more urban suburban areas? I know I experienced that in Virginia. Yeah, yeah, certainly, yeah. And, and it's a partnership. Maybe you don't experience that in Maryland, <laughs> but in Virginia we do. Final point, Mr. Executive Director Scott Patterson, um, your principle sounds deceptively agreeable. Gosh almighty, you know, that if it's truly national, fine, but if it isn't, leave it to us. Those are arguments that were used about hunger and malnutrition in America. Those were arguments used about civil rights in America. I mean, isn't it where you sit? what constitutes a national issue versus states' rights issue? Well, certainly, and I, I think where we are right now on that, those are the 30,000-foot the principles. But the bottom line is just work, I think if uh, state and local government is working with the federal government to focus on results, whatever they are, decrease infant mortality, whatever they are, that's where we want to go. I gave you an extra 10 seconds because you had to define See, that, was, that was him rule. that went over, not me. But you had to define Dylan rule, so I'll let you do that. <laughs> Ralph? Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Mr. Commissioner, uh, tell us how the states are making it more difficult for counties to retain their, their tax revenues. I'd, I'd love to. Um, Quick, we are, no. <laughs> for the majority of the states across the country limit our ability to raise revenue. And at the same time, what they do is they come at us and tell us how to spend what we have. I'm, I, I'm in Florida. Uh, the legislature put a referendum together that effectively is offering an increase in homestead exemption, which is a big win for the homeowners, and everybody's excited about it, and it's going to pass. And to the, us in the counties across the state, it represents three-quarters of a billion dollars out of our budget. So we're, we're getting shelled on the revenue side from a standpoint of money in the door, and then we're being held down as far as what we can collect. So, And 70 percent of my budget in Leon County is state and federal mandates, so there's a limited Thank amount you. of discretionary income. Thank you. Uh, my previous experience as well. Thank you. Uh, and this is not for an answer now, but I, I would appreciate some written response because following up on Mr. Connolly, you know, states' rights, national priorities, constitutionally permissible, and the issue of preemption, federal preemption over states and localities and counties. Uh, let me use one example that is, that is can be and has been divisive. Uh, a statue, a change in law uh, around the issue of immigration where uh, the requirement is for cities and counties to help enforce that federal law and federal mandate. Cities and counties through their own elected officials decide that they're not going to participate. Sanctions or threats of sanctions to follow. 
this delicate question, how does it reconcile itself with this picture of preemption? How does it reconcile itself with, with the whole issue about, is it in the eye of the beholder? Or is, it, is there a definition that uh, would include this kind of a question? Yield back. Thank you. Well, I hope you're going to do, you're answering that in writing, right? Yes. Good, perfect. <laughs> uh, a gentleman from Alabama. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to, this is a question that any one of you can, can uh, respond to, and that is uh, regulatory impediments to infrastructure. I chair the uh, subcommittee on intergovernmental affairs under the oversight committee, and this is something that we're looking into now. So uh, I think all of you have experienced this at, at one time or another. If you'd like to comment on it or if you'd rather respond in writing, I, that'll be fine with me. I also want to ask, and, and uh, any of you can respond to this, and it, particularly, I think, for uh, uh, states and counties is uh, the issue of consent decrees, uh, sue and settle, and how that's impacting your ability to, to govern at the local level. Senator, would you? Mr. Patterson, you can begin if you'd like. You need to oh, I'm sorry. Thank you. I, I think what would really make a difference and what needs to be think about, thought about, and I think this task force can be a part of this, is to ensure that there is a bit more formal processes in which state and local government is involved with the federal government to focus on the results that folks want, as I mentioned to, the, to uh, Representative Conley, because unfortunately what's happening is these types of things are being more mandated and imposed from the federal level. Those consent decrees are good examples. They can last for years and years. And what really should be the goal is solving the problem and getting the result you want, not worrying about the details that are often dictated from here in Washington. I mean, I'll talk to the regulatory reform question. Um, Waters of the U.S. for us as, a, as an organization was a showstopper, and, uh, we, and we're going to go through the rewrite now. Um, there are a number of things like that, and we'll make sure we respond in some specifics, but there are things like out there that really make our job untenable at the local level and almost undoable. I mean, there are issues where we can't perform the job we're expected to do because our hands are tied. So uh, we, would, we would love to give you some detail on that. Great question. Thank you, Mr. Thanks. Chairman. I yield back. I thank you for that. John? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The Supreme Court's held repeatedly that Congress can put reasonable restrictions on the receipt of federal money. For example, if you want highway money, we need as a state to adopt a federal uh, standard uh, uh, speed limit, uh, uh, seat belt laws. As the chairman of the Commerce Justice Science Appropriations Committee, I ensured that the receipt of federal law enforcement money is conditioned on the uh, state uh, enforcing a federal, uh, making sure that they're in compliance with a federal public safety law that says you have to cooperate 100 percent of the time with federal immigration authorities uh, to eliminate uh, essentially sanctuary cities. If a state wants to have sanctuary cities, that's their business, but don't ask for federal money if you won't follow federal law. Uh, so the quickest way, it seems to me, to deal with the restoring Tenth Amendment authority of the states would be to um, give the state legislatures the ability uh, to vote up or down whether or not to receive federal money. Most federal grants, in my experience, are accepted at the local and state level by agencies or bureaucrats who are unelected. So I wanted to get your thoughts on what about making federal grant money, uh, make it uh, essent make, uh, as a condition of the receipt of federal money at the state level, make the state legislatures vote on the record, accepting all the strings, all the conditions, all the uh, restrictions on the state authority uh, on the record so that they've got to go home to their voters and explain, I surrendered state sovereignty to the federal government because I wanted that federal dollar. And not really, but I will. <laughs> <laughs> Congressman Culberson, you, you raise a good point. It's, it's, I'm not sure what the metaphor is. It's sort of like putting your, your money where your mouth is or vice versa. Mm -hmm. Well, it's and, with our kids. You know, my money, my rules. That's right. And, um, and, and we have grappled with this in various ways in, in Tennessee, for example, this year in looking at... Um, transportation funding and tax reform, we, we had to grapple with the, the open container rule. Uh, it meant several million dollars to the state if we would, if we would ban open containers in vehicles. And um, some parts of, of my state um, didn't want to do away with that red Solo cup in the car. 
and uh, we had to actually discuss it openly. I remember one time we were looking at a, um, a grant that had been proposed to, uh, I think, the Department of Environment and Conservation for, for all of $25,000. We were actually able to take it up and decide whether we wanted to do or call before you dig a number of those. Um, it's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise well worth engaging in, and it causes people to focus. They like to complain uh, until the money's gone. We're going to bore it on you. this. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank, thank you very much. Mark. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks again for your leadership on this. I, I uh, want to dial down at some point. This is long term. As far as the relationships between the state and local tribal federal levels uh, of what's working, what's not working, today my quick question is what areas need readjustment? And I'll start with you, uh, Executive Director Parkinson. Uh, what's not working is a longer discussion. What is working, we're okay, but, but the areas of readjustment, are there any places to chime in? And I'll, re I'll yield back to you guys to try to, to give me an answer on that. Well, I hope this gets to your question. I, I think it comes back to really the, the relationship. I think that, that we feel what's, the, where the imbalance is, is that state and local government really needs to not only be heard by the federal government, but taken seriously in terms of regulatory processes and other types of activities, including legislation. And we feel that often that is not taking place. We can help you at the federal level get to the results you want if you talk to us at the very beginning of the process and throughout, and that we can negotiate a way to get to the results. It sounds like you're kindly saying it's too often one directional and it's too late in the game before you guys are brought in the equation and say, now make, make this work. Is that, that fair? That is true, okay. yes. Anybody else want to weigh on that question? And it's a, it's a three-legged stool, and we'd like to be part of that stool as well. And the reality is if you don't open up the communications at the beginning, not at the end, you're, we're going to run into problems. It's a Hippocratic Oath that doctors take, which is do no harm. You know, you take a drug here, there's an adverse impact over here. So oftentimes what's well-intended, we have unintended consequences at the local level. So quickly, yes or no, more than the programs we're getting into themselves, we are saying the relationship is first and more, most important. Is that fair? Anybody else disagree with that, or is that fair? Uh, yeah, and I, I think I, I want to note, too, in terms of enforcement and, and working with us, we, we need to make sure that the people that are enforcing are adequately staffed, and we don't have to deal with a back, long backlog of, uh, of regulation before we can get something done. I thank you. I, I thank the witnesses for being here uh, and the members for being here. This is the very beginning, and it's simply the beginning. There is no way in one hour we're going to actually resolve anything. but. As we go through with this task force, my goal is to try and get out of the philosophical and actually get down to some specifics that we can use to actually change the practices that we've done in the past. And I appreciate the questions you've had, the statements that you've made, and I appreciate if anything that you want to us to try and get to the members of this task force, please give it to us. We'll make sure that, that happens one way or another. And with that, we're going to end this, this hearing this time. And we'll look forward to next time, and with other members of the advisory panel, we'll actually be coming back here and speaking. Maybe some of you will join us again at some point. Thank you for being here. Thank you for members. We're done. Yay. I am hungry.